So following your election to the presidency, did you make an effort to instate Hankins as soon as the president? Or? I ended up, I tried to, um, I tried to appoint him to the Senate and the administration essentially said no, we refused. So what I did, I was really, I was very reckless my first year as Senate president. I figured I was only going to serve one term. I was about to graduate. I didn't care what the administration said. You know, I had gotten elected in this overwhelming election, really with no platform. My platform was I wasn't the other guy. So I didn't really owe anything to anybody. Um, I said, okay, well, screw you. The, the student Senate president has senators that he appoints, but because I'm student body vice president, I also have an executive cabinet that I can appoint. So I said, I'm going to make James my director of, I think I call him my legislative liaison. And since those positions weren't explicitly defined in student government, the way the PRR was written, the PRR didn't apply because it only applied to explicit positions. I was like, these serve at the will of the Senate president. I can invent a position out of thin air. So I made him that legislative liaison, which gave him the angle to always be at the Senate meetings. And since I'm the presiding officer of the Senate, I decide who gets to debate. So I would like give him the floor whenever he wanted to talk. Um, and that was really part of how we were able to make so much stuff happen my first year is that it really came down to we're going to do what we want to do, administration be damned, and all of us were on the same page. You know, so he was being there working on stuff. You know, we created the, the Haunted Hillsboro hike. That was a brand new thing that we did. We created this fee referendum over administrative opposition. That was brand spanking new. And once we started doing it, it was working so well that everyone was like, hey, what other reckless stuff can we, can we do? You know, it was just like party time in the student government as far as like doing whatever we wanted. Um, so yeah, I tried to get him in as much as I could, and he actually ended up, um, so he was legislative liaison. Uh, I talked with the president of ASG, who, you know, now I'm a delegate because I'm Senate president, automatic delegate to the organization. Called up the president and said, look, my friend James is applying to be one of your executive officers. Really appreciate it if you gave him a job. You know, and he became, I think James was like the associate vice president for academic and student affairs in ASG as well. So he was able to continue being involved student government wise, even though technically he was a foul of the PRR. Because I thought it was a dumb regulation, I wasn't going to follow it. So you just mentioned the fee referendum, so we'll mm -hmm. talk about that if you don't mind. Can you describe the student fee referendum and how your administration implemented this issue? Yeah, that was fun. I, I enjoyed that. Okay, so. Not that I would ever, especially in light of that campaign, admit that I admire anything about Chapel Hill. But um, one thing I liked about the Chapel Hill student government was that for certain fees, they allowed the students to vote. And if the students voted the fee down, the fee increase didn't happen. Now, the thing that bothered me was that it was only for certain fees. So like the student government fee, the, the graduate student whatever they are fee, you know, only some of them. Well, I said, you know, we, if y'all can do that, we can do everything. So I... Um, you know, I talked to Dr. Stafford and the folks in Holiday Hall, and I said, you know, I plan on having a fee referendum. And they looked at me and they said, no, you're not. Um, and I was like, did you not notice this? Um, I said, we're going to have it. Sorry. So I was trying to figure out how to do it without the administration being on board. And I came to this, you know, epiphany. Look, we control the voting software. The referenda uses the voting software. The only challenge that we had was that the administration controls the voter roll. If we can't get the people to, who are allowed to vote from registration records, there's nothing we can do. So I talked with uh, Eric Fabricius, the guy who wrote the voting software. I said, look, can you create a function where we can take the voter roll from the fall election and just duplicate it? Because the fee referendum was in October. So fall elections in September, there's really no change in who's eligible to vote. Just have an automatic duplication function. He goes, yeah, we'll do that in you know, a couple weeks. Does it, rolls it out, so now, essentially, even though they control the voter roll, I control it in between elections. You know, SG controls it in between elections. We have to get their permission for fall elections and spring elections, but anything in between, we can do what we please. So the very first year, we um, created a special election focusing on the fee referendum, and the administration, like, literally refused to participate, would not give me any information at all. All I had was the public records that were given to the Board of Trustees. So I created ballot wording that was as balanced as I could, saying what the fee was about, what it was supposed to go to, and in the ballot provided a direct link to the Board of Trustee document. And we said, hey, we're, we're going to have this election. Let's do it. We talked with technician. Technician was publicizing it. And we had it. And it turned out fairly well. You know, turnout wasn't that great because it had never been done before. I think we had just over 1,000 students vote. But if you were to look at the breakdown of who voted, 
it was like 20% freshmen, 20% sophomores, 20% juniors, 20% seniors, 20% graduate students. Like you couldn't get a more even distribution. And in terms of distribution by college, there were votes from every single college roughly in proportion to their overall enrollment. It was like a, a, st a statistician's dream as far as exit poll results. You know, it's perfect. So, you know, we presented that, uh, the, the fee referendum results to the fee advisory committee. And the first words from Dr. Stafford's mouth was how, how many people voted. I said, only 1,000. He's like, okay, so one out of every like 27 students, this, and, and you had like no information on the ballot. You can't be serious. This doesn't count. Um, but the plan for us was that, you know, in years past, the Senate was the one that was the student voice on fees. When UNC General Administration changed the, the policy manual to create these fee advisory committees, essentially Senate got bypassed. You now have a fee advisory committee with student appointees. So over time, fewer and fewer administrators were presenting to Senate. So I was trying to figure out how to get administrators to focus back on what the students cared about. If you're not going to go to the Senate, at the very least, you have these very public vote results that I'm going to distribute far and wide. And I could tell, and it, it, I remember the exact moment it happened, where we're in the fee advisory committee meeting, Lee Fowler is up talking about the athletics fee. I ask him, I say, how can you justify this fee increase when 90% of the student body voted against you? And he goes, well, those are only the people that were opposed. There could be 90% of the students that supported that just didn't express their opinion. Personally, I thought that was a silly thing to say, but I said, okay, whatever. The very next person to present was Larry Nielsen, the provost. And he, before he goes into his speech, he goes, before I get started, let me just say, I actually like the student results because the ETF fee had majority support. That particular moment in time, I said to myself, that's exactly what we're looking for. Because what happens now, after we leave this building, is that different administrative units are going to try and figure out how they can get the results in their favor for next year's fee advisory cycle. So as we did it the second time through, I, I told them at the beginning of the year, we're going to have these referendums. And I also wanted to have them, uh, the, the committee's deliberations videotaped so we can put videos online instead of linking to the Board of Trustee documents, link to the videos and let students um, do it that way. And, uh, you know, I worked with Dr. Stafford and we came up with a compromise for that so the videos were put online. I mean, no one watched them, but like 30-something people. Um, but at least it was there. Students had, for the first time ever in NC State's history, all of the exact same information as all the fees advisory people. They knew in advance the referendum was coming. The different campus units wanted to make sure their supporters, you know, turned out to vote for it. And you had more than triple the turnout. I think we had like 3,000, I want to say like 3,180-ish um, turnout in the second election, more than triple. So by that point, I'm like, okay, this is a trench. This is on its way. This is cool. Um, and that was kind of where we went with it. And I think, you know, the year after I graduated, they did it again. I think the Rally for Tally referendum had like 8,000 something people, just huge numbers of folks that we never had had the ability to do that before. And it was really, it was done out of desperation because I recognized the Senate was losing its ability to influence the fee debate. By putting that in place, you now had fee committee deliberations, a student vote, then a Senate vote based on a student vote, and then the fee advisory committee had a final vote where they now had student feedback, Senate feedback, everything else. It completely altered the landscape of the process. That's great. Um, as student Senate president, you called for a congressional appeal of a bill that limited financial aid given to students with drug convictions. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to advocate for that? that, that ironically enough, that was another uh, Matt Potter initiative. Um, he was a senator my first year, and I didn't know about this, where you know, if you have a prior conviction, even if you haven't touched anything drug-related since, you can't get financial aid. And, you know, I've never done drugs in my life, but I know a lot of friends who smoked weed. And if that were to ever, you know, come out, they would be SOL. So he came up to me and goes, you know, I'm really, I'm, I want to talk about this bill. I know you're a law and order Republican, but look at it and let me know what you think. And he gave it to me. And, yeah, I might be a law and order Republican, but what I was thinking more of was, you know, flashback to 2000 where I can't pay my bill to state because I can't get financial aid. In my case, it was because of a family issue, but I can't imagine someone, you know, if you got convicted in high school when you're 18 of, of a marijuana violation and you can't go to college because you can't get financial aid, 
that's that is just the, the most it's one of the dumbest things I've heard of in my life because what's gonna happen is that you now can't get a college degree you will be like me working jobs that don't pay anything because you're not educated which will make you more inclined to do things like break the law it just it logically does not make sense um, so he showed that to me I said you know what I think this is great write the bill I'll be a signatory for it I'll lobby the other senators we'll pass it and we'll go from there so that was kind of the background at some point, if y'all get a chance, you really should interview Matt Potter because he's, he's an interesting guy.